So I watched a video recently by the Action Lab asking and trying to answer the question, how many holes does a straw have? And apparently this is a thing on the internet and the answers are usually given as either one or two. And as with many raging discussions on the internet, what this comes down to is that people don't really have a good definition of what a hole is. So I thought I'd uh, do a video explaining from uh, a topologist perspective how you might try and answer this question. So in topology, your objects are sort of very stretchy and maybe you can change something that looks like a hole into something that maybe doesn't look like a hole. Right, here's an example, here's this cup. And I think most people might say that this cup has one hole in it. Um, but I can deform this cup a little bit. I can make it a little shorter. I can make it a little wider, a bit more like a bowl. And does it somehow go from having one hole to having no holes? Does it have half a hole at some point? At some point, if you keep deforming it, it'll turn into uh, a plate, a disc. Does this have a hole in it? Most people, I think, wouldn't say that this has a hole in it. But let's stick with this. Let's suppose that we want to say that this has a hole and that therefore this has to have a hole as well. So what do you do? What is the feature of these things that they both have, which is one of? They have one circle on their boundaries. So this is sort of a modeling question. How do you model these objects mathematically to decide this question, how many holes do they have? So we can think of this as being essentially two-dimensional, having zero thickness. And if we do so, then both of these things are zero thickness objects that have boundary to them. Uh, and the boundary of both of them is a circle for each of them. And the straw has two boundary circles, so it has two holes. But this is unsatisfying for maybe a few different reasons, because it is kind of weird to think of a plate as having a hole. It's not how we would usually think of it. So if you go with this idea of uh, being able to squish things arbitrarily much to change what their geometric shape is while retaining their topological shape, you're not allowed to tear things, then you can send uh, a straw into sort of more like a ring shape. You can make it fatter and wider and turn it into maybe if I thicken it up a little bit because straws aren't infinitely thin, then eventually it'll turn into something like a donut shape. So there's a few different ways that topologists have to try and formalize this idea of how many holes something like this has, and so you want the answer to be one. Um, and at their intuitive core, what they're saying is, how many ways are there of catching a loop of string around the object? And I want really sort of independent, different ways to do this. So, you know, here's the string in one position, here's the string in another position, but I want to say they're really the same, right? There's no difference in how I'm doing it between these two positions. Whereas, Here's a pair of scissors. There should be two ways to do that that are really independent. So if I've looped my string through this hole in this pair of scissors like this, there's no way I can sort of move it around to get it to go through the other hole. So this one has two holes because there's two different ways uh, to, to loop a piece of string through uh, this object so that it's caught on. If you think about this a little bit further, then you'll find that there are actually other ways to loop a piece of string through this. So for example, I can go through twice. And there's really no way to turn this going through twice into the just going through once loop that I had before. And in a sense, this isn't really new either. This is sort of twice the previous one. So really what happens is that rather than saying, I've got one hole, really you're interested in a group structure of how many times you can loop this thing through the various holes, whatever that means. So the two most basic ways that mathematicians think about how to add together loops to make other loops are via the homotopy group or the fundamental group of an object um, and via homology groups. And I won't go into those things, but those are things you can look up if you're interested in looking into this further. Things get more complicated and you need these sorts of group structures to understand a question you might ask how many holes does this not have in it? So yes, you can get a loop to go around here, but you can also move it around to other places. 
And is that really different from a loop that goes around one of these other lobes? And it gets complicated. And so you have to go to this fancier structure. Rather than just counting holes, you have to talk about groups. So what is the answer? Is it one or two holes? And well, really the answer is it depends on what you mean by a hole, and it depends on what you mean by the object. In both of these cases that I've been talking about, we've been modeling this physical object as either a flat two-dimensional surface or something with material that can be sort of squished around and, and uh, thickened up, and they give, gave different answers. But both of these require us to model the world in some way. The straw is not a two-dimensional object, it has thickness. And it's not a solid three-dimensional object either. It's mostly empty space if you go down to looking at the level of atoms and electrons and quarks and who knows what. So is there any way to answer the question, how many holes does a straw have, without making a modeling assumption that it's either a two-dimensional surface with no thickness or that it's thickened up and actually solid? So one way to try and answer this question is to look at something called persistent homology. So the idea is that all that you have as data is a collection of points in space. Let's stick to atoms, let's not go below to quarks and quantum stuff. But let's suppose that you've got a bunch of points in space and you want to know, is there a loop, uh, some hole in this bunch of points of sp in space? And at first sight, the answer is no. I can take some infinitely thin uh, piece of string, imaginary because any piece of string is going to be made out of, of atoms as well, and pass it through this collection of points and it's not going to get caught on anything. So the idea is to take uh, the points that you have and draw a little ball around each point of some radius. And so far this isn't really changing things. So if I replace all these points with these little balls, they're still completely disjoint from each other and they're independent. But what I can do is I can keep increasing the radius until they start overlapping. And you keep going with this until they start to link up into shapes. And at this point, you can see that this does have a hole in it. It's got a hole in it, just the bit that I've done so far, right here. But that's not a real hole, right? That wasn't part of the ring that we can see. So what you do is you keep going and you make them even bigger. For every possible choice of radius of these balls, you ask what is the number of holes that this has? And not only what are the different holes or how many are there, but you want to identify, say this, this red dot here, that corresponded to a hole, but it only survived for a very short period of time as I increased the radius. It appeared and then it got filled in as the balls got bigger. And so what the persistent is in persistent homology is this hole here, that one hangs around for a long time over many different radii of the balls that you choose. And so that should be an important thing, that should be a real hole in my object. So for something like this straw, you could do this down at the atomic level. If you scanned this and you said, okay, there's atoms all over the place, and then you increase the radius up to, uh, well, I guess I don't know the density of atoms of plastic in this thing, but you would increase the radius up to some point, and then you would only see this one hole going through uh, the, the tube of the straw, and that would persist and for many, many radii until your radius was sort of uh, half the diameter of the straw. So under that sort of analysis, uh, even if all you had uh, at your disposal to answer the question was where are the atoms in this straw, um, you would get a fairly good sense that there was indeed one hole in this straw. How do you discuss this without it getting very... You can also ask the question, how many holes does a person have? Um, so if you get your ear pierced, then you've increased in the number of holes you have by one because, you know, this new uh, loop that goes through your ear is not going to be the same as some other loop. And again, you know, you've got all this question of how do you model it? Is a person a two-dimensional surface? Certainly not. Are they a solid object? No. Um, so this persistent homology thing might help you with that as well. 
Although it's sort of tricky, right? There's an obvious hole that everybody has is the one that goes down your mouth and down your intestines and out uh, the other end. But even with persistent homology, it's sort of tricky, right? Which of the bits inside of you are you and which of them are just things you're digesting? Which bits count? Um, and is there actually a root all the way down which has only air in it? No. Um, so yeah, how do you actually measure this? Maybe this is a question for the comment section. How would you determine how many holes a person has, uh, preferably without killing them? Um, I'll look forward to your answers. Thanks for watching.